father was a wordsmith, and one of the one of the words that he taught me was oxymoron. Anybody know what an oxymoron is? It's two words linked that don't really go well together. Anybody know any oxymorons? Jumbo, <coughs> jumbo shrimp. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> one of my all-time favorites, jumbo shrimp. It's right up there with peacekeeper missile. <laughs> you know any others? You got the point? Military intelligence. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah it's, that's up there with good boss. How about health care? Health care? <laughs> it's amazing, huh? It's amazing what we do. How about Nixon started a good one? Marijuana initiative. Well, that was a good one. So, <clears throat> to me, sense and nonsense and common sense, uh, keeping my head thinking clearly, I would watch people say stuff that was just absolute trash, contradictory bits of information that couldn't possibly add up, and watch an audience full of people just go, oh, now I understand. And go, how is it possible that they're shaking their head yes to such a thing? Who are these? Why are they not seeing that this is, this is, each part of this was a contradiction with the rest. Well, you know, it just takes special people. And what I found over time is that, that for the most part, there's only two kinds of people that end up taking better care of themselves than everybody else. And those two kinds of people are either super motivated or super smart. And there's only two kinds of super motivated people. And the super motivated ones are either super sick or super well. You're either world class athlete wanting to be the best of the best or Doctors are telling you, like, there's nothing more we can do for you, sir. Start getting your paperwork together, kind of thing. And then you get real motivated to, like, well, maybe I'll try something else. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you'll try anything. You'll try anything rather than take your last breath. That's the one thing we really guard, isn't it? That last breath. We don't no rush to use that one up. <laughs> So, what I found out was that there are two models of health. One is called a health model, one is called a medical model. The medical model says that what you do to get healthy is completely different than what you do to stay healthy. So, They say, there's a war on drugs. Don't take drugs. If you're well, the drugs will make you sick. Don't take drugs. But if you're sick, the drugs will make you well. And I'm wondering, how do the drugs know whether you're sick or well? And they tell us the kids should drink lots of milk unless they're sick, in which case the milk will make you congested. And I'm wondering how the milk knows. And they tell us that homeopathic remedies will get you well if you're sick. But if you're well and you take them, they won't do anything. Smart little pills, aren't they? To be able to tell if you're sick or well. And know when to do something and when to do nothing. How do they do that? Well, the health model says essentially the opposite. It says that that the substances and forces and influences and conditions that you would utilize to stay healthy when you are healthy, sunshine, fresh air, pure water, physical activity, enough rest to support that, all of the things that we do to continue our health when we're healthy are the exact same things that we should be doing to get well when we're sick. But sick or well, 
we still have to modify all of those substances, forces, influences, conditions. We still have to modify each of those to the needs of the individual each and every day. Because some days you just need more sleep than others. And some days you need a little more food or a little less food. Or you want a little more alone time or a little more time with people. And so we have to shift around. But the, but the stuff that's good for you is good for you all the time. And it's good for you in moderation. The stuff that's harmful for you is harmful for you all the time. How harmful? Depends on the dose. The bigger the dose, the more harmful it is. And what we find is that people get confused because we're taught a certain way and the reality is a slightly different way. We're taught nutrition as if more equated to better and highest related to best, when this is not the case. And we know it's not the case. We know that if you take too much of a fat-soluble vitamin, you die. You need to get the right amount. If you have too little, you die. If you have too much, you die. You need it in that target, in the middle of the continuum between too much and too little is just right. We know if you take not enough vitamin C, all sorts of problems happen. Teeth start falling out. Your gums get sick. The continuity of your tissues begins to break down. The integrity of your cells starts to fall apart. But if you take too much vitamin C, you get diarrhea. In fact, we're told that the way to figure out What's the limit? How much vitamin C can you take? Is just keep taking it till you get diarrhea and then back off a bit. But more does not equal better. I mean, sun, sunlight's important for you. But you could get too much. And if you do, all you have to do is get out of the sun and your body heals itself. The fact that your body runs the show, that's the ticket. Your body is in charge. But it does so, so reliably. It does such a good job of it. It, it so quietly just goes about its business that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that your body is running the show for you. That your heart's beating and your liver's living and your kidneys are kidding or whatever it is they do. It's a good thing we don't have pistons, isn't it? So, there was a time a long, long time ago your mommy and your daddy made you. You don't want to think about what they were doing at that exact moment in time. Right? Don't go there. <laughs> Not my parents. <laughs> but they made you. And two cells came together and made one cell, which is a freak of math. <coughs> one and one make one. It's the only time in the world that I know of that one and one make one. But uh, that one cell, that was you. And you didn't tell it to split into two, or four, or eight, or however many more times it split, before it got to be a hundred 
trillion cells sitting in a folding chair. Right? With fingers and toes and eyes and ears and taste buds and all those bits. Hosting more bacterial cells than human cells. By the way. We're actually just a bunch of bacteria. We're like the we're the the transport unit for bacteria more than we are even us. <coughs> Separate story for another night, perhaps. So there you are, inside mommy's tummy, a gooey blob of undifferentiated cells. And a week goes by and you become a slightly bigger gooey blob. And then the strangest thing happens. This little dark spot appears inside the gooey blob. And the dark spot sprouts a stem. And if you look at it under the microscope, it looks basically like a little turkey baster inside the gooey blob. And that turkey baster eventually sprouts a bunch of telephone lines. And at the end of the lines comes all your organs. And then buds. The gooey blob buds. Four buds. And you get arms and legs and a head. And the head was the top of the turkey baster. Your brain, inside your head, was the top of the turkey baster. Your brain, the rest of it, your spinal cord, the lines, your spinal nerves. From undifferentiated cells came this magnificent being of differentiated cells, and nobody knows <coughs> how that happens. So Claudette, would you mind telling us how does that happen? Because nobody knows. But apparently, we like to think that we're in charge of our bodies. We're not. We're just visiting. <coughs> it's spectacular. It's amazing stuff going on. And then people come to fast, and they, you know, they come to me, and they say, look, I want to fast, and I'm going to come down to your Costa Rica event. I mean, I know it's the best fast in the world, and it's the idyllic setting, and, and nothing could be better, and, and there's more staff than there are fasters, and we're going to be well taken care of, and it's going to be really good. And I've got a list of reasons why I'm going to fast. You know, I've got this rosacea, and my eyes are just, my eyelids are red all the time, and, and, and I get acne, and, and my digestion isn't exactly the way it's supposed to be, and, and my left knee is arthritic, and, and I need to fast. I mean, it's just getting worse. If I made a list, if I made a list of things, of all the things that I want to clear up, I mean, I, I could barely fit it onto a sheet of paper, and they show me the list, and I go, that's very nice. The list I want to see is the one your body would write. You go, well, I don't know what my body would write. And I don't know either what their body would write. There could be a spot on their kidney that's just threatening to turn into a tumor. There could be anything going on inside. There could be cholesterol lining all the way through the 50,000 miles of vessels. And the stroke is about to happen with the cardiovascular accident. We don't know what's going on. They could be this far away from kicking over into diabetes. We don't know. I mean, one second you are, one second you're not, right? It's just a matter of the straw that broke the camel's back. We don't know what it is. I can tell you this. I can absolutely promise you this. Your body doesn't even listen to your agenda. 
It just follows its agenda. And when you fast, should it happen that your agenda happens to align with your body's agenda, here and there, now and then, great, lucky you. But the body's going to heal itself regardless of what's on your agenda. The body's going to run the show. And this is what happens when you fast. All anatomy and all physiology, that structure and function, or for the artists in the room, form and function. All anatomy and all physiology vector towards health when we fast. What is fasting? Fasting is what happens when you take resting to its logical maximum end point. How much rest can we get? Well, I'm standing, you're sitting. Relatively speaking, you're resting more than I am. But there's people lying down who are resting more than us. When you're lying down, you're getting about as much physical rest as you can possibly get. But there could be sensory rest. We could be listening to bird song, or we could be listening to cars going by. Which would be more restful? We could be under natural light, or these, which aren't bad. Nice lights. But I've certainly been under worse lights. It could be cold, or hot, or too humid, or too dry. Sensory, input. The sheets could be comfortable or scratchy. When you look out the window, you could see green, or you could see buildings. It could be a big open vista with water in view, and or it can be claustrophobic, <coughs> or no windows at all. Sensory input is huge. It's huge. Have you ever been to a dentist's office and noticed they almost all have, what, fish tanks? So you won't be so worried. Lower your blood pressure a little before you go in. Just look at fish in a tank. color of restaurant walls. They make them a certain color because certain colors leave you more prone to eating and other colors don't. Mm -hmm. We're far more affected by our senses sometimes than we realize. I have a friend who was in a terrible, terrible accident. When he went to the hospital, I mean, everything was broken. It was a nasty car accident, and he was broken from head to toe. Literally, everything was broken. And the doctors did not think that he was going to pull through. And they talked about him in exactly that way. They had to do their job, but he was already a goner. And he was not as out as they thought. And he picked up his head and said, guys, I intend to live through this operation. Could you please approach me and the work you do on me as if you intended me to live as well? And it was a real shake. They did, I mean, there's people on him right away putting him back to sleep, you know. But, but uh, it was a real shake-up for them. And they said, yes, of course we will. And we'll, yes. I mean, they needed their attitude adjusted. And they got caught. But... They talked about him the rest of the way as if they expected him to live, and so did he, and he did, and he lived to tell me the story. And, and um, how we approach things is, is vitally, vitally important. Could you imagine being in a hospital where the doctors are saying, the likelihood is you're, you're not going to do well. You're not going to get out of this alive. Uh, going in to have a hangnail removed, and the doctors are saying, this is going to be very, very bad. You know, it's like, no. Sensory rest, physical rest, they're not more important than emotional rest. 
The number of people who, who come to take a rest and just can't let everything at home do its thing for a second. They need to be in charge. They're not type A personalities. They're like triple A's or something. I don't know. Emotional rest, having people to take care of you and let you know all is going to be well and that you can just relax and we'll cover it for you. Here, let me get this for you. We've seen thousands of people go through this before. It's going to be fine. What a difference this makes. When I was in school, I took a course to become an EMT. And the doctor said, here's what you say when you go up to somebody who's had a car crash. He said, you tell them your name. You say hello, you tell them your name. And then you say, I'm here to help you. He said, it doesn't matter how bad the crash is. You just walk up and say, hi, I'm Dr. Krantz, I'm here to help you. Or whatever the, right? And it's just, he said, the person will just, so different, you'll lose people. If you say, oh, this looks really bad. Yeah. Walk up and say, oh, this is bad. <laughs> Reminds me of the story of the, I used to ride my motorcycle back and forth to Montclair State. It was Montclair State College back in those days. And you used to have to drive up and down the turnpike because they didn't let motorcycles on the parkway back then. And, uh, and so you had to drive with all the trucks. They didn't have separate lanes for trucks and cars back then. <clears throat> I just remember is how cold it was. It was just so cold. And I remember going home at Christmas time one year on my motorcycle. It was so cold. I was losing use of my hands. I, I was doing some very dangerous things on a motorcycle because I was now like holding the handlebars with my wrists trying to like, because I couldn't grip them. And, uh, it was a mess. But it reminds me of this story about these two guys who were riding their motorcycles in very cold weather and, and they finally pulled over and said, this is, the wind is just whipping through. Let's just put our coats on backwards so the wind doesn't keep jumping in the front of the coat. And they zipped each other up and off they went and of course they hadn't been riding very far before a truck sideswiped them as he changed lanes and just didn't even see him. And they had just a horrible crash and both of them were unconscious and one of them finally came to. And when he came to, there was EMTs all around the place and they go, hey, this one's alive. Because he doesn't look good, but he's alive. And the first thing the guy said is, how's my buddy? And they said, well, he was alive too, but by the time we got his head on straight with his coat, he was done. <laughs> so. Your body is running a show for you. And we're doing this physical rest, and physiologic rest, and sensory rest, and emotional rest. And what is the physiologic rest? We can't tell our heart to beat less. We can't tell our kidneys to kid less. In fact, we want them to really go. We can't tell our liver shut down. I mean, we depend on it. What we can do to get physiologic rest is we can stop eating and ask our digestive system, allow our digestive system, to take a break. And most people equate fasting with not eating. That's not what I think it is. I think fasting is a deep state of physical, sensory, emotional, and physiologic rest. That's when you're fasting. And if you imagine for a second how much benefit you get in one night's sleep. 
Had no more energy, wake up with energy. Feeling bad, wake up feeling better. Where I grew up, we didn't used to work from dawn till dusk. We used to work from can till can't. When you get to camp, you go to bed. And it's amazing. You wake up in the morning and you can again. Can till can't. A tremendous amount happens when you take a night's sleep. Can you imagine taking three nights sleep a day? Day after day after day, how much healing can happen? It is miraculous how much healing can happen. And I've watched more people heal from conditions that they were told were incurable, because that's the way the medical people go about it. They don't say, there's nothing else that we can do for you. They say, there's nothing can be done for you. And that's a whole other world. It's a positioning that they use, as if there is nobody else but them. Well, I fasted again and again. I ended up fasting five times, in fact. And when I was in school, one of the doctors taught us a fair bit about fasting. And even gave us the opportunity to fast while we were in school and to compare notes. There's 118 people in my class. With 100, my, my first supervised fasting experience was to participate with the doctor and 118, 117 other fasters as I found out about their fasts and they found out about mine. And so the first time I ever supervised a fast, I supervised 117 of them. Along with help, of course, I was still learning, but it was, it was a good introduction. Did that several times in school and eventually helped some of the other classes as they went through their program. It fascinated me to see what was going on in even just a week. And eventually when I got out of school, I opened up a fasting retreat down in the Florida Keys and ran it for 10 years. And a woman named Susan came down from New York. And she had a condition known as MCS. Heard of it? Multiple chemical sensitivities. These are the hyper-reactive people. These are the people who sense, you know, when you go in your doctor's office and the sign says, please don't wear any perfume because there's some people that are really reactive to your, right? These are the people who sense stuff that you can't even sense and it makes them sick. You start wondering if maybe it's even real. Maybe they're imagining it. I don't know. It's making them sick. Whatever it is. So Susan comes to fast, because one sure way to get over MCS is through a fast. And she fasts for a few days. She's a bit of a bit of an uh, peculiar person, we'll call her. She's a bit of a peculiar person, but who isn't? I certainly am. So Peter came to my office one day and said, I'm a race car driver, and I can't work because I've got chronic fatigue syndrome. In the 1980s, chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome was a new diagnosis. <coughs> Nobody was ever diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome in the 70s. It didn't exist yet. And chronic fatigue syndrome is what happens when you get very, very tired. Your adrenals, as the expression goes, are in the toilet. You've lost the ability to function. And Peter couldn't work, couldn't do much. He's sleeping massive amounts and it's not helping. 
And he came to fast. You go to bed at night, you're tired. You get six, eight, ten hours, whatever it is, and you wake up and you feel pretty <coughs> good. When you have chronic fatigue, you need an adult-sized portion of rest. Some serious, supersize it for me, would you? When Peter went to sleep, once he relaxed into his fast, it took him a couple of days to really relax, and then he went to sleep, and he slept for 60 hours. Got up to pee a couple of times, but other than that, he just slept for 60 hours. Woke up, <clears throat> talked to me a little bit, <coughs> had one day of relatively normal, went back to sleep and slept again for 60 hours. In the course of one week, he slept 138 hours. You do the math for me. Whatever 7 into 138 is, comes out very close to 20 hours per day. He slept a lot for three weeks, and into the fourth week, and along around the end of the fourth week, he started perking up, feeling way more energetic. He hasn't eaten in four weeks, but he's feeling incredibly better. Broke his fast, started feeding him again. Said, what, how you doing? All is well in his world, but he doesn't have a job. He doesn't want to race cars anymore. And I offered him a job. I needed a, I needed a gardener. He said, but it's really, really hard work. We're in the Florida Keys. It's 80 degrees every single day all winter long. It's 90 every single day all summer long. It's hot. It's humid. It's sunny. It's a lot of work to be a full-time gardener. And he just started working as a full-time gardener. Absolutely nothing to it. Seven days a week, putting in a full day every single day and just loving it. He wanted to stay. He stayed with me for a couple of years. <clears throat> Nada. Nada was a young lady and, and rivals the most beautiful young ladies in the world for beauty. Just stunning. Hard to imagine such beauty. And she's an identical twin. Donna. Donna and Nada. I didn't name her. <laughs> <clears throat> and Nada grew up in Australia. And I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie called Whoop Whoop. Do not watch it. It is an absolute waste of time. It's very sick. But apparently based on Nada's real life. At age six, the entire town began the sexual abuse of Nada and her sister. There was nowhere to turn because the entire town was in on it. It lasted for 10 years before she and her sister could run away from home, which they did. She's an incredibly brilliant girl. She took all the right therapies, tried everything she possibly could. By the time she was approaching 20, she felt that in many ways she was over it and just living her life. But then she met a guy who fell in love married him, and it all started again. It turns out the guy wasn't a whole lot better than her dad, no surprise, but she relapsed into what can only be described as post-traumatic stress syndrome. She started having nightmares every single night. She could not sleep 
without having nightmares. <coughs> she started losing her confidence and became afraid to go outside for fear that somebody might grab her and afraid to stay home alone for fear somebody might come in. Afraid to answer the door, afraid to answer the phone, petrified to take a shower like out of an Alfred Hitchcock movie. She was living, whether she was awake or asleep, in a nightmare. She wouldn't show her face. And when she finally came to fast, which was her absolute last resort, she said, if this doesn't work, I end my life. Said, oh, don't put any pressure on me, Nada. <laughs> I tried to be lighthearted about it. <coughs> But folks, it's life and death. Each and every one of us is going to take a last breath. Are anybody in a rush to get there? <laughs>